90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Virginia Soybean Association is hard at work sharing the story of Virginia soybeans. The Children's Museum of Richmond at Short Pump is a great example. You can check out the new Soy More exhibit and learn more about the amazing bean. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today we visit with a breeder of miniature cattle and find out what makes them so popular. Then Mark Vietta's tips on pruning evergreens. We'll also have the Ag Calendar, a Minute in the Field video, and of course your Ag News of the Week, all on this edition of Virginia Farming. The 2016 Virginia State Fair has come to a close, and the giant watermelon contest set a new record. The monster watermelon weighed in at a whopping 245.7 pounds and was grown by Davis Wells of Hanover County. Wells set a previous watermelon record in 2007, and last year Wells won the competition with a 161 pounder. And after growing pumpkins for nine years, Ricky Atkins of Southampton County finally took home a blue ribbon in the giant pumpkin competition. His winning pumpkin weighed in at 879.5 pounds. Well, another record could be broken this year, this one in corn production. Corn production in the United States is now forecast at 15.1 billion bushels, up 11% from last year. Yields are expected to average 174.4 bushels per acre, up six bushels from 2015. If realized, this will be the highest yield and production on record in the United States. U.S. beef producers have a lot going for them, but there's always room for improvement. In this segment, an agricultural economist shares suggestions to remain ahead of the competition. Bob Cervera has more. Compared to the rest of the world, the North American beef community has a distinct advantage. We are the center globally of grain finished beef production. So we do compete globally with a lot of grass finished and there's some growth of grain finished elsewhere. But in aggregate around the world, U.S. and Canada combined are kind of the core of that. Looking toward growth, we have the ability to get that high quality beef to market too. We also have a lot of infrastructure here that's not in existence elsewhere, whether it is the feed grain base, but you know, modern and large economies of scale feedlots, packing industry, well-recognized safety institutions. Um, for the most part, we have you know, well-working trains, rivers, roads, all that kind of stuff that a lot of times we take for granted, but it is here and compared to other parts of the world, it's relatively maintained, we can rely on it, we can build our industry from it. But our grain-finished beef is among the most expensive options among all proteins, even when compared to other beef suppliers. So that gets at the point of the value, right? So the eating experience, the story with the beef, other points of differentiation beyond price are critical because we're never going to have an absolute price advantage. The economist says other countries are making inroads, and the only way to keep ahead is by increasing information flow throughout the chain. The U.S. beef industry is less coordinated and uh, communicates a little bit less effectively, both vertically in the industry as well as horizontally in each sector than our competitors in other meat sectors as well as competitors around the world. And that's a huge challenge because it, it limits the ability to make changes. Tonsher expects the trends to intensify, not tail off in coming years, and urges the entire cattle industry to respond. I'm Bob Cervera. Thanks, Bob. Cold weather is just around the corner and many areas of the U.S. have seen recent flooding. The USDA reminds us to think ahead and try to implement some of these precautionary measures build a strong shelter to protect animals from the elements. It should be able to sustain high winds and heavy rain and keep them dry. Consider building it on high ground to avoid flooding. Have adequate food and water supplies for livestock. This will be important if you aren't able to reach them for a day or so. During extremely cold temperatures, you'll need to break up ice or replace the frozen water. Provide warm bedding. During a blizzard or extremely frigid weather, warm bedding is essential for all livestock. 
make sure that there's adequate bedding for each animal and replace it when needed. Assess farm safety. Check the safety of your farm and consider the condition of your home, barns, and sheds for sustainability of high winds as well as heavy rains or snow. Take corrective action now and reassess periodically. How best to protect your livestock and farm animals in extreme weather will depend on the size of your herds, what type of animals you have, and how extreme the weather actually gets. Providing the basics, food, water, and shelter will go a long way to keeping them safe. Well, miniature breeds of cattle and horses have become quite popular. We'll visit Bryan Hill Farms and find out what makes their mini Herefords and Halflinger horses so special. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. So today we're in Broadway, Virginia, and we're visiting Bryan Hill Farm. It's a farm that raises miniature breeds horses and cattle, actually. I'm joined by Tim Bryan. Tim, thank you so much for having us out to your beautiful farm today. Thank you, glad to have you. So tell us how you guys got into the business of many, many cattle. Many cattle. <laughs> I guess it started back 13 years ago. My wife and I was on a vacation in Texas and uh, seen a sign, miniature cattle. So that sparked our interest. Well, sure. So what did, you, what did you do when you saw that sign? Did you go look at them and see what they were all about? We did, and it took, we took a year to research the miniature cattle because we didn't realize how many different breeds there were. And uh, uh, so it took a year to decide what was best fit us here on the East Coast. And you guys decided on Herefords. Mm -hmm, the miniature Herefords. And why is that? Uh, they have a lot of nice traits, but the biggest thing I liked was the predictability. Their registry is a true registry with the American Hereford Association. So um, you, you have hundreds of years of the, the, the lineage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why is that important to you? From, even from a consumer standpoint, why is that lineage important? To me, there's, not, there's no big surprises. You know, what you see is what you get. Right. And uh, I enjoy the, breed, the breeding process of it. And uh, that's what I like. Okay. It seems like the, the miniature breeds are really growing in popularity. Can you, can you give us why you think maybe they might be so popular? Here on the East Coast, there's a smaller farms, farmettes to smaller farms, and the more moderate frame cattle, the smaller frame cattle can produce more beef on the, that, that amount of acreage. Okay, so let's talk about that acreage for a little bit. How much land does it take per per head of the, the mini Herefords? In this part of the country, you, we figure about 2.5 minis per acre. Per uh, acre. Per acre, and okay. that would change depending on what area you're in, but uh, okay. if you manage your ground well, that's... And then what about feed? Obviously they graze, but do you feed, feed as well? We do, it's not part of their daily diet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're, they're a grass animal and they do well on grass, okay. but we, we feed enough to keep them uh, humble and coming to us and, uh, and we do, f we grain our animals to butcher. Right. So give me an idea of the difference between raising a full-size Hereford as far as the cost or maybe how much that cow would eat as opposed to one of your minis. How much how much does that eat? How much would the mini eat compared to the larger animal? If you say a larger animal would be about a 1,400, 1,500 pound animal, and uh, they would eat, so you can, on the same amount of intake, you can raise 2.5 of these. So if, if they weigh 750 pounds, and you times that out, that's 15, and so you're producing about 2,000 pound of meat okay. on the same acres that you would run that 1,400 pound animal. Wow. So give me a comparison in weights to a normal size Hereford compared to a mini. What's the weight difference? A mini can be, depending on the size and frame score, it can be a, a mature animal can weigh 500 to 850 pounds, something of that nature. Okay. Where a, a mature uh, full size cow would be 14 to 1800 pounds. Okay. So on the consumer side, because you say you do raise these cattle for meat, mm -hmm. when, when we butcher a full-size cow, there's a lot of meat there. And 
you know, I was, I was talking to your wife, Debbie, earlier, and she mentioned that she thought that maybe one of the reasons that these smaller breeds are popular is because the smaller cattle can fit into a freezer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can purchase a whole cow where sometimes you could only get a half or a quarter of a larger cow. I didn't realize that was going to be such a nice thing because all families don't have a, as much money nowadays, and they really do like the amount of impact the smaller dollar amount to butcher and to buy the beef up front. We do, we have raised them to butcher and, and, and the end user buy it from us, but then, but in the recent years, there's a gentleman that I've sold animals to that has a nice little market, so he has the, the butcher, the everything, the package, and he's only uh, showcasing miniature. That's all he deals with. Okay. And, and so he's... So you can actually, this guy actually just butchers and sells Miniature breed meat. Miniature breed meat. And he wow. lives in Pennsylvania. He comes down and buys every steer that we can produce. Uh, and it's that fits us now because it's simplistic. He's got a nice market, cornered market, and he's done the the marketing and the selling and it's to that. So uh, Right. Okay. Um, now you guys have kids and I know they help out on the farm. How do you think the mini breeds play in with the kids? They've got to be easier for them to handle. The one that they're not as intimidating. The, the intimidation factor is is a lot better. Right, right. And how do what do your kids think about the cows? Do they do they enjoy do they enjoy working with them? They love them. I have the oldest daughter. She's really the cowgirl. She's always liked them from day one. She really enjoys the showing part of it. She's 13 years old. The middle daughter, she's always the horse girl, but in the last year or so, she's uh, really gotten into showing the cow too. Okay. So, uh, they're at the age now where they're uh, doing their chores and they're really taking care of the herd for me. And at, at that size, you feel more comfortable with them than being with a larger animal, yes. I'm sure. It does make a difference. Now, you just mentioned your middle daughter being the horse girl, mm -hmm. and we haven't really gotten to your horses yet, but you guys also have raise a different, a fairly different breed of horses. Tell us about them. They're called halflingers. They're a small draft breed. And uh, when I say small, they're still an average size horse. They're around uh, 13 and a half to 15 and horse. And uh, they're just a good family horse. Uh, they're easy natured, uh, they're pretty. They have a, flax, a white mane and tail, and some kind of a chestnut color, whether it's dark mm -hmm. chestnut or light chestnut. And, uh, we drive them, even my middle daughter enjoys the driving part. She can drive my team. Uh, okay, so, so you say she drives your team, but where? What, what do you, do you put them in parades? Do you, do, you rent, do you rent them out for weddings? Or what do you do with these horses? We've done a little bit of both. Uh, we do the, go to certain events. There's different events on the East Coast that we go driving events. Uh, actually, in two weeks, there's a parade here, so we'll uh, have a, a parade. We have a stagecoach that we like to hook up to it. And um, we even use them here on the farm. Like, we'll drag the fields, and we have a sickle bar mower. We'll cut the grass and help maintain the farm here with them. Well, when I walked into the barn, I saw all of their harness collars mm -hmm. up there. You've got enough for a, a pretty good team of mm -hmm. horses. <laughs> yes, we do. You could maybe, uh, if you, you know, craft breweries are really in, you could maybe you could start your own brewery and have your own Clydesdales. We do. We've, <laughs> <laughs> in years past, we've had a four horse hitch of them. So four in a row. And we're working towards uh, getting the right four horse hitch together now as we speak. So. Okay. Now, I know from, from speaking with them off camera that your kids are involved in 4-H. Do they show any of your mini breeds at fairs or in other shows? They do. They, uh. Here at the local level, they take a mini out to the shows, and uh, they have to show against the full-size Herefords, but they still enjoy it, and they represent well. But they love to go. We go to Louisville and Ohio. is the closest miniature, true miniature Hereford shows here on the okay. East Coast. Okay. So. All right. Now, when these, when the mini Herefords are born, what size are these calves? Oh, they're, they're 25 to 40 pounds. They're, uh, they're adorable. It's almost so. the size of a dog, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Wow. They would have to be cute. They are. Because yeah. this little guy behind us here is adorable, and he's about five months old, five I think you said. Five to six months old, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
They're just, they're great. That's uh, my, my boy, he's five years old. That is his project this year. He's taken ownership of him and uh, showed him at the local fair all three weeks ago. So. And how'd he get along? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> of course, at that age, they all get first place prizes, but. Uh, well, you can't, they're just too cute. Mm -hmm. Between your son and the cow, it's, you know, it's a winner. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so what are some of the differences when you go to invest in a smaller breed that might be a different cost as, a compa as compared to raising a larger breed? Well, there would be a, uh, some savings as far as maybe upfront cost of the different type of working facilities and handling that you would need for the animal. Uh, second would be that you might not need the, uh, the same caliber of fencing as, a, as you need for a full size. Other than that, it's probably the intake is a major difference in a full size and a miniature. Okay, and then that's up to you as far as what you graze and if you decide to grain feed. That's right. Correct? Yes. A couple different avenues. People, uh, some miniature breeders only are a grass fed type application or an all natural product. Mm -hmm. They go that way. Which I think the majority of our full size animals are usually grass and then finished on grain. That's a true statement. For the most part. Mm -hmm. And for our customers right here, that's what they prefer. Okay. The grain finished? Yes. They, they want something that resembles what they go to the store to purchase. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't care for the gamier taste. Right. And that grain finish helps produce marbling, mm -hmm. it doesn't does. it? Yes. Okay. What's your favorite part about having these, these mini Herefords around the farm? I've really come to find that they're just a wonderful animal as far as from the reproduction aspect of it, they, uh, they're, people are worried about the, uh, maybe problems with reproductive. Uh, I've found that not to be true. Um, enjoy the breeding process, putting A and B together to see what C is going to mm -hmm. be. So all of yours are bred artificial insemination? We do some of both. We okay. artificial breed every year to bring new ge genetics into the herd, but other than that we have we keep about four or five different bulls okay. that we run animals with. Uh, here on the East Coast, there's not, the numbers are not here, so I have to work at keeping a variety of genetics so that someone comes to us, can buy a nice little package of unrelated animals. Okay. Do you think this is something that's going to grow? You said there, there aren't really that many here in Virginia. Do you think it's something that's gonna take off soon and more people are gonna be raising the mini breeds? It ha yes. It has, and we've seen that in the last 13 years. We've been into this 13 years, and we're up to, uh, we keep about 65 to 70 mature cows on our wow. farm here, and uh, yes, the interest has only grown in these. Do you have any, uh, any words of advice for someone who may be interested in, in raising? You know, how many, you said maybe two per acre, two and a half small breeds per acre? What, what other type of? That's a question a lot of people ask. And I do a answer it in a couple of different ways. First off, I've found that uh, for them to go find somebody that's been in the breed a while, mm -hmm. that has an understanding and, and, uh, and communicate maybe what their wants and needs are. And because I found most all the miniature breeders are very good at helping you reach your goal. Okay. And, and uh, so if you do a little education, kind of learn what you think your goal would be with them. Uh, right. And your all's goal is, is what? I know you sell some for meat, but then your other is to sell for breeding for genetics. Is that correct? Yes, there's a beef side, a genetic side, a show side, and a, just a pure enjoyment fun side. So that's, that's our, our market here on the East Coast. Okay, all right. Well, Tim, thank you so much for having us out today. We sure have enjoyed it. Your horses and your cattle are beautiful. Well, thank you. And they're also very adorable, if I can say that, because mm -hmm. they're small and they're cute. And the, the, This gentleman in Southern Pines just bought four animals, and, and he texted me the other night and said, uh, uh, they're adorable, they're cute. He said, can cattle be adorable? <laughs> I said, most definitely. Most definitely. Yours are definitely adorable. So, thank you. We'll be right back. evergreens may seem like a daunting task, but Mark Viet has tips. Let's go in the garden. A common question we get is, 
Can I cut down or trim some of my evergreens that have gotten too big, especially around the house or maybe even in the garden? The answer is probably not if they're around the house. In some cases, a common plant that they use around the house is either Hinoki cypress, arborvitae, dwarf Alberta spruce, and to tell if you can prune these or not, there's just, you know, sort of a general guideline, not foolproof, but close. So you're, I'm just gonna show you an example here of a branch. Plants that you might want to avoid trimming or trimming hard are gonna be plants that show very little growth inside the canopy. So even when you pull down these branches and you look inside, I see almost no green or very little green in the way of new shoots. If you were to see a lot of green shoots up and down the stem, that might be an indication that yes, you can still prune it back to where it's still green. The general guideline is you can go back three years if you don't know. So three years is only about maybe five inches. And you can tell even going here three years, there's no growth. So this plant may not regrow. So what you're gonna end up with is when you're done pruning it, you're just gonna end up with a lot of stubs. So what you don't want is something that looks like this, because honestly, you're gonna have to live with it. On this beautiful yellow, bright yellow Camacypris, you can see lots of growth sort of around the outer edge. When you peel back some of the edge and look inside, there's very few shoots or very little green growing on the inside. So right away, this should be a sign to you that you might want to prune this, but in a cautionary uh, way. If you look here, there's very little growth inside. And what you don't want to end up with is little stubs. And you can find those. I pruned this out earlier and maybe three years ago, this branch was pruned here. And as you can see, there is no growth. There never will be growth. So it's really important that you pay attention to the way your plants grow. If they're really vigorous and full, that's an indication it can take a little more whacking back. Now, for those of you who do like to work in a garden and are looking for something to do, I've not forgotten about you. This is one of my favorite, it's a rather large growing juniper. It's Juniper Hetzai, or the Hetzai Juniper. And it is one you can cut back pretty hard. So compared to the others, if you look at this, look at all the shoots up and down the stem. So you can cut this way back in here, 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 or here to get your work out for the day. I'm Mark Biette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, Virginia State University's College of Agriculture presents the 2016 Small Farm Symposium on November 16th in Danville. There will be presentations on marketing, value added, and GAP certification, as well as a panel discussion and luncheon. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and continue watching because in a few weeks, Virginia farming is getting a facelift in more ways than one. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Get in touch with us to hatch a new plan. 